Well, like a lot of sea anglers, I've spent a lot of time wondering what on earth's going on underneath the water. Are the fish actually there? And if so, what on earth are they feeding on? I've spoken to a lot of anglers over the years and everyone's got their own little ideas about watercraft. Um, and I thought I'd bring some of those together so we can perhaps look at some of the things you should be thinking about when you're fishing along the UK's coastline. So looking here at a Friday, 7th of 12th, you've got a low tide there at 5.27 and a high tide's at 10.48. And then on the same day, you got a, goes back down to the low tide at 17.47 and back up to high tide right in the evening there. And the figures there, you can see that you've basically got two high tides over the course of that 24 hours. And you see these figures in brackets. These are the height of the tide and these will change depending on the well where the moon is in relation to the sun and we'll come on to that in a minute you can see on the next day there on the um, morning high tide it's 7.41 meters whereas previously it was 7.42 so it's obviously getting slightly smaller uh, in its size it's not a big difference here you could find it gets there's a bigger variation in the difference but it's worth noting that not all tides are going to be the same and uh, this really helps the angler when you get this sorted out so what we've got here on this diagram, uh, when the sun and the moon pull in the same direction, it leads to bigger spring tides. And then when they are at right angles to each other, uh, which you can see on the top picture, uh, you've got neap tides, which basically means that the tides, uh, the spring tides are really big, and then your neap tides is less tidal movement. Two things to be aware of. Weather, of course, affects the fishing, and some people say uh, an easterly wind, you don't catch fish, or when the wind is in the east, you catch the least. Uh, it's not exactly true, but it is definitely worth considering the wind direction. That does affect locally uh, how places fish, an onshore wind that is making fishing difficult as well. So always check out the wind, and then if you do catch fish, you want to make a note of uh, the direction that the wind was uh, moving in as well. Uh, big storms are always interesting, not necessarily fishing in the storm, you're l unlikely to catch in, in really rough weather. Uh, it's what happens after the storm, particularly on a beach, flat beach. You can find that uh, the storm has dislodged a lot of bait fish and bait, things like lugworm, razors might be washed up. And that's a good time to target fish like bass and even cod in the winter uh, because they come and get easy pickings that have been... Uh, pushed out by that storm and during calmer periods of course the water can clear up as well here on the south coast we suffer a little bit from the chalk and and it uh, clouds the water up quite easily but after a flat and calm period you'll find that the water clears and of course it's more conducive then to your lure fishing uh, so think about what the past weather has been like and you might want to put some lures in your fishing bag if, if uh, things have cleared up Meanwhile, on the west coast, places like Cornwall and Devon don't suffer quite as much, and you'll find you can uh, use a lure a lot more often than you would. For now, we featured this beachy head um, mark in one of our videos, and it's a really interesting example of imagining the tide coming in. You can see there you've got lots of gullies and ridges and pools, and each of those will hold fish as the tide comes over. So it really is a case of getting down there and seeing which part of the tide uh, fish is best. Uh, I tend to find on this particular venue actually uh, catch quite well on an early tide. Um, but also a high tide as well, about an hour before high tide. Uh, and it's very often the case that the first hour of low tide where there's not much movement um, but as soon as the tide picks up and it starts pushing through, then you've really got a, you know, you've got more tidal movement to get the fish. And take a note at low tide. I always say this, but you know, if you look at low tide, look at what's happening with the water when it comes over those marks. You might want to have a bait ready to go into a particular gully. And then think about the ebbing tide as well. Have you got a large body of water that's funneling through a, a small gap in the rocks? All the fish that have come up on high tide have to work their way out there, so it's a good ambush point. You've, the time of the year your fish is going to be important as well. It's a bit of a general rule, 
uh, and and with all these points really it's there are exceptions but I mean we've even had uh, tuna this year down in the southwest and off the coast of Ireland uh, there's been trigger fish caught as well in the summer uh, sunfish have been seen so the seasons are changing and the range of these fish Generally, I wouldn't fish till April or May when the peeler crab molt. And these peeler crabs um, sort of see the first run of fish. The flounder will feed off this. Uh, the bass, of course, love hunting through the gullies for the peeler crabs as well. So it sort of kick-starts the season in spring. Uh, you can also get a spring run of codlin some places. Uh, Chesil Beach will see uh, some codlin there. Yeah, things really start to happen. You'll start catching your first place as well in spring. And then that moves forward to summer, uh, where you've got smaller bait fish in the water, so the uh, lure fishing for the bass becomes a little bit more viable. And uh, things really kick on from there. Uh, mackerel shoals will start visiting the, uh, the beaches in about June or July here. Uh, and they'll stay around actually all the way into November. You can see here I was actually catching these mackerel in November of all times uh, it's one of the latest months I've managed to catch them and I've had bass all the way into December on the lures but gen generally August and September for your bigger bass and then what are the fish actually feeding on well uh, down here in Timmouth we're having a look at uh, what we found in the, the rocks here got a hardback crab lots of crabs here just one scoop of the net finds plenty of prawns as well so it's a good indication of what the fish might feed on as that tide floods and ebbs now this is Timmouth Bridge that separates Timmouth and Shalden in Devon and what happens here I think is that the bass will sit underneath that pier and there'll be uh, down tide of those big uh, stanchions there and they're basically lazy so they'll wait for the tide to flow past and with the tide will come things like sand eels and they'll dart out of their uh, little hole almost um, out of the tide and then take the bait as well from there so have a little think about the um, natural and man-made features that fish might be taking advantage of And the other thing I'd mention is I think we all need to take notes as well. So every time you go fishing, you need to write down as much detail as you can about the conditions you fished in, uh, what fish you caught, and equally as important if you didn't catch as well. If you had a blank, uh, there might well be a reason for that. These are the criteria I use for taking notes. You can obviously develop your own one. If you want one of these, uh, send us an email. Uh, details are underneath. Okay, we're almost there. I know it's gone on a little bit, this video, isn't it, really? Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to put in here uh, a little top 10 video we did about a year or so ago on the top 10 ways to avoid snags. I'll put it in here because I think it is quite relevant to a bit of watercraft because uh, it hints at what's going on under the water. But if you're a beginner, hopefully you'll find one or two of these uh, tips quite useful. Eight snags. <laughs> One of the best things you can do is get down at low tide, find the really snaggiest of snaggiest rocks, try and avoid them when you start fishing. Now you could always use heavier line as well. The thicker line is less likely to cut on the rocks. What about your rod tip? If you've got your rod tip at a higher angle, then you're less likely for that line to drag in the surf and get you into snags. And if you've got a fish on, then it's time to retrieve that fish and the terminal tackle uh, a little bit faster than you normally would. You don't want to miss the fish, but it's worth bringing it in quite quickly so you don't snag up. Now, using a pulley rig with less clutter is a great idea as well. And the good thing about these pulley rigs, when you're retrieving them in and you've got a fish on, uh, then the weight will lift up on the rig assembly and it's less likely to snag on the rocks as you lift it up. Make sure you choose the right weight as well. A too lighter weight can get pushed into the snags whereas a heavy weight when you're retrieving it more likely to drag along the bottom and, and snare your bait so choose the right weight for the conditions. It's really worth keeping a watch out for the tides and the currents as well so maybe cast up tide and let the weight drop into the position you want it to stay 
and that way you're less likely for it to be pulled across to a, a snaggy place thinking slightly outside the box just don't bother to bottom fish at all you can use these fish black minnows they've got their hook point at uppermost and they're really hard to snag and of course the other thing you could do is use a float as well another thing you can do is get a grip lead and get the wires and just turn those at right angles or even get a, um, a lead with really long grip leads and then turn those out at right angles each of those in turn with some pliers and the good thing about that in theory is when it drops down near a small little crevice like that yep, um, it should stop it going down those smaller ones and that's the worst of the snags those you're not getting it out when the lead drops down and gets stuck so use those grip leads at a right angle I'm going to shoehorn in the old downloading Google Earth Pro as well. I absolutely love this program. We've done a video on it before. Um, but you can actually see. You can see um, tidal patterns. You can see individual rocks and boulders and snaggy areas. Particularly if you're fishing a new mark um, and you're not sure about the snags, then have a look at Google Earth Pro. I'll even leave a link at the end. But before we look at number one, um, there's plenty more things you can do. You've got to know your venue. You can practice at that venue as well. You'll get to know exactly where the snags are. I've used underwater photos and videos in the past. You've got the benefit of knowing what fish are actually under the water in clearer conditions, of course. I've used float markers as well with old bottles. I can cast the bait to the bottle, particularly between two big structures where I think the fish are running and then fixed spools you get a faster retrieve with fixed spools over most mot multipliers um, my number one tip though would be to use one of the rotten bottoms um, so it's basically a weaker bit of line tied onto a stronger bit of line and the idea is if the lead part of the rig gets trapped um, it snaps off so we've got 40 50 pounds here and then the thinner black line is 20 pounds you just hook that on there it won't take a power cast but it will get you out of the snags because that will come off and then if it does get snagged it will snap off and that will leave you with the hooks and hopefully the fish on the other end as well and there you go that completes uh, number six of our seven part guide to sea angling um, it'd be great to have your comments as i say um, i'm not professing to know everything here but i just really wanted to start some dialogue as to what's going on under the water